Hello, I'm Donna Lachau, and I'm here to talk to you today about little miniature figurines. Little Wars was a documentary that I made when I was in film school long, long time ago. And it was something I worked on for my, my year-end show. We'd each have a project where we'd spend a very long time making a film about something we were passionate about. End of the year would come and we'd present it to the department. Peers, professors, a whole lot of people would gather in an auditorium, probably about this size, about as many people. And each of us would show one of our films. And so the year in show came, and showing Little Wars, the auditorium's dark, it's quiet, some papers were rustling. I'm, I'm thinking, you know, this is, this is awesome, everyone's going to love this. I thought it was the coolest topic ever. Basically, it was about these people who would reenact wars with tiny little miniature figurines. And they would hand paint them, and they'd have these giant conventions around the world where hundreds of people would gather and they'd have these desktop war reenactments. And the people were, were, were fascinating. I wanted everyone to be as fascinated about this as I was. So the lights go up, the film is over, I run up on stage, my advisor introduces me, my palms are sweaty, I'm so nervous, and I'm ready to, to, to take questions and field comments. This is, this is what we called critique. So, one of my classmates, his hand shoots up before I can even entertain, you know, and say, hey, I'm ready to take questions. His hand shoots up, can't even call on him, and the first words out of his mouth were, I can't believe you made me sit through that. Now, it turns out this film that I thought was so engaging, so exciting, such a cool topic, I had artfully put together and to an eight minute piece de resistance and I was so proud of, it was utterly boring. It didn't engage people. They were kind of irritated that they lost eight minutes of their life. They didn't know what the real purpose of it was. They couldn't kind of follow. Stuff just happened and then it ended done. Fast forward many years. I, I now work in, in tech, don't work in film. A couple years ago I was working at a startup. It was a health and fitness startup. And for me the, the transition from film to tech was, was, was pretty, pretty natural because a lot of the things we do are the same and a lot of the ways we do them are the same. For instance, you, you come up with a concept and then you try to get funding, then you, you launch something, and eventually you, you probably, chances are, bomb. Whether it's an entirely new startup or idea, or you're working for an existing brand or product and you're just launching a new feature or a tiny little tweak, success doesn't happen all the time. We call this failing fast now. We've figured out ways to mitigate this, this and actually just build faster and learn faster and you know, know that we're still going to fail, but f failure is something that, that we embrace. The thing about films and engaging an audience, which is something that at this startup we were completely unable to do. We couldn't get people to sign up to use the product. We, if they did sign up, we could barely get them to use it. We couldn't get them to return and continue to use the product. It was a, a, a way to kind of track workouts. And we definitely couldn't get them to pay to upgrade to continue using the product. And with film, what I eventually learned is that it's not about a concept. Without a story, you cannot engage an audience. So the model sort of flipped for filmmakers. It's not about just an idea. You've got a story, and then you go full circle. You set the foundation for engagement. Now, at the point that I was working with this startup, I had to start wondering, you know, could it be the same thing? 
Could a story help engage our, our customers? The answer, I'm just going to tell you, I'm not going to leave you hanging because you're, you're here hearing a talk about story. And yes, the answer was yes, story helped essentially save the startup. We were about to go out of business. We had six months to live. You can't make this stuff up. Suddenly we had to figure out, what do we do? And we scrambled and story saved the startup. But how? And that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. In order to understand how story flows through products and services and things that people use, you need to first understand what a story is. And more importantly, not just what it is, but how it works and what it does to us as humans. So I'm going to walk you through one of my favorite examples to kind of get you an idea of how story functions. And first, just set the stage. You probably know this already. Every story has a beginning, a middle, and an end. Then on top of that, though, this is what took me many years of trial and error in, in film school to realize is that there has to be a structure to it. Otherwise, it's just stuff happening. This is what we traditionally call the narrative arc. And on this arc, there are plot points. And there are things in a series of events happening in a certain order, and they work and operate in a way that resonate with humans. So back to the future. Have any of you not ever seen Back to the Future? I always have to ask. OK. Wow, Portland's pretty cool. Every other city, there's always at least one person, but not, not in Portland. So awesome, let's go. Back to the Future. Here's how story works. First, we got the beginning. The fancy word is the exposition. This is when we are introduced to a hero. And every hero has a goal. Usually at the beginning of a story, this, this goal is really lofty. And so it could be something like adventure or just making something of yourself or just doing cool things. In this case, we've got Marty. He's got this awesome friend and they have a time machine. And oh my god, this is, this is the coolest thing ever. Early on in a story, something then has to change. We call this the inciting incident or complication. This is often when something goes wrong in the world of a story or just something shifts enough to make us as viewers become ever more invested. Because the exposition starts kind of good and rosy so that it can then be taken away from us and we empathize that much more with a main character who we've been introduced to. So in Back to the Future, the Libyans shoot Doc and it's all very bad. There's plutonium in a parking lot and oh my god, now what? This is, this is when the action really, really starts. So, the x-axis is time. Think about the y-axis as, as action. What we've got next is what we call rising action. Things just get more and more interesting and engaging over time. So in this case, Marty, he goes back to the past. He meets his mom. Things get weird. She has a crush on him. And a whole lot of other stuff happens. And it's, it's kind of things build. And eventually, around 3 quarters of the way through, you have a crisis moment. And this is where we start to wonder, will he or won't he make it? It's the point of no return, essentially. Either it's going to work out, and then we're wondering how, or it's just going to be a cliffhanger, maybe something to be continued. If this was a TV show from the 80s, it would be dot, 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 to be continued, and then next week you tune back in. Somehow the problem has to be resolved. The thing that happened in the inciting incident, he, he needs to get back to the future. But how? So in this case, he starts to disappear. He can't play Johnny B. Good, and oh my god. What then? Well, his parents kiss. Problem resolved. He will live, which is great. But he still has to get home. So this leads into what we call falling action. This is often a very fast series of events. You have the climax, it's the high point, everything's awesome, things explode, it's exciting. Then the, it, it, the problem is resolved, but movies and stories still have to end somehow. Falling action, or denouement, the, the fancy French word for it, literally means unraveling, 
we are at this point in the audience tense, we're invested, we're thinking, what's gonna happen? How is this gonna you know, end? Things need to unravel and action starts closing down and winding down. We calm down as we see what's going on. In this case, there's lightning, it's exciting and electricity and great. The end, we're back home. A lot of stories end with the main hero ending up back home at some point. The key with good storytelling is that the hero has to be changed in some way, shape, or form. Ideally, they should be smarter or have had their adventure or no more, a little better off than where they started, but you still want to bring the action down and bring the main hero back home so that we kind of have a closure that we as humans want. Humans need closure when we're watching movies, reading books, but also when we're doing things. So we're talking about Hollywood so far, but I want you to look at this photograph. Now, if I'm gonna, if you were in my workshop yesterday, you're not allowed to answer this question, but for, for the rest of you, if I were to tell you this was an Apple product that these two people are using that comes pre-installed on every iPhone, I want you to shout it out. What, what are the, what, Apple product are they using on their iPhone? It's an app. FaceTime. So how do you know it's FaceTime? Well, when we look at photographs, something happens. And we start constructing a narrative in our heads. We see them, oh, these are obviously two grandparents, and maybe there's a, a you know, problem. They, they want to see their grandkids. They're not living near their grandkids. Obviously, they love their grandkids, so they use FaceTime to call their grandkids. Obviously, it worked out because they're smiling, and you know, in the end, they're happy that they used FaceTime. It's a pretty simple story, but this is the same structure that guides fiction that guides movies, that guides using products and looking at photographs. So the mental math that you all just did to compute in microseconds what these people were doing is the same mental math we use when we use products ourselves. So if these two people weren't actors, which they are, and they were two grandparents really using FaceTime, they would be constructing the same narrative arc over time. So the thing about story is that neuroscientists, psychologists have been studying this for years. Essentially, life is a story. It is the structure and what guides the human experience. It's how we make sense of the world around us, and it's how we communicate with the world around us. Now, I want to clarify something about, about story, because Storytelling is something that you hear a lot about these days in tech circles, in business circles, in marketing and sales. How screenwriting root guru Robert McKee teaches brands to tell better stories. This is an article that you see very, very often these days. This is something in, in Fast Company. Um, storytelling your way to a better job or stronger startups, New York Times irresistible power of storytelling as a strategic business tool. Storytelling is very, very much in vogue right now. And it's something that every executive wants. They don't know what they mean, but they want it. We want storytelling. Let's get storytelling. Now, storytelling is one thing. But what a lot of us are tasked with when we build digital products and services, whether you're a designer, a product manager, an executive, a founder, it, the list goes on and you can even work on marketing teams, that's okay, or sales. It's not storytelling, it's a kind of story making. If our customers are making the stories in their heads, it is our job to make the story as good as it can be. And there's science about this that I'll talk about, but there's a reason why story functions the way it does, and a big part of that is memory. And a lot of that starts with an origin story. This is when a customer first uses your product or service, and it traverses that moment of hearing about something through discovering the value and then actually becoming a dedicated customer. 
it's really important to get origin stories right because it's, it's your fast, fast meaning within 24 hours often, fast and easiest way to get people hooked and excited about what it is you want them to do. So I'm going to show you an example of a really, really, really ugly origin story. This is my origin story with Pinterest. Pinterest is a visual bookmarking tool. It's something that I use pretty often, about half of my friends use pretty often, hundreds of millions of people around the world use pretty often. And a few years ago they came on the scene and kind of just went viral and a lot of people in the industry didn't understand why all these people were signing up. So this was an email that I got from Pinterest a few years ago, really ugly, and the copy is kind of brilliant. It says, check out my stuff on Pinterest. Hi, I set up a Pinterest profile where I can share the things I like and I want you to follow me so you can see it, exclamation point. Once you join Pinterest, you'll be able to create your own collections and share your taste. Thanks, Erica. Now, Erica is my partner. And at the time, we were decorating our living room, and we were trying to find paint colors that match the couch, and we were trying to do all this, all this stuff, some container gardening outside. And we were bookmarking a lot, saving things on Twitter and favorites here and Google Reader at the time, and Star here, and uh, there's also Facebook. Sometimes we'd email stuff back and forth. Sometimes I'd get so overwhelmed that I would just print things out and create scrapbooks. It was, it was a fun project we were working on. But this email just got me going right away, and I became a converted Pinterest user pretty instantaneously. And it wasn't just me. This is the email that hundreds of millions of people around the world were converted with. So why would an email like this, it's otherwise pretty ugly, grammar is kind of weird, what, how, how did this function as a story? Now, I'm going to lay this out for you very formulaically. First, we've got someone who, big goal in life, Collect images, share images. Very lofty, right? Very important stuff here. The thing about collecting images and sharing images is that it's, it's kind of a, a pain. At the time, it was very much so a pain. All these different places to do it and different ways, and most of my tools were definitely not visual, and it just was really chaotic. But it's not the kind of pain where I moped around all day thinking, man, life sucks. Bookmarking is hard. I wish there was a better way. It, digital products, especially, are just, just not like that. It's a pain point, nonetheless. So, all right, I discover Pinterest. There could be a crisis here. It could just be a matter of like, well, uh, you know, we don't want to adapt new products or services. And this is something that came up a bunch in the workshop yesterday where there's always this question of, do you need a crisis? Do you not need a crisis? And the, you know, my favorite designer-y answer is, oh, it depends. But know that there's always a crisis. Humans are resistant to change. We just don't want to adapt to anything. And we definitely don't want to sign up for new products. It's not our goal in life. So there's always conflict. But again, if you think back to the story structure, Conflict is good. Conflict makes things better in the end so that there can be a high point that overcomes and resolves any conflict that there could possibly be. So in this case, simple. It's visual collecting and sharing. That's all I needed to hear. It was a pain to collect and share visual things. So I get an email hear about this thing, Pinterest, it tells me, hey, it's visual, I'm done. Find this out on places like home pages, landing pages, app store, email, ads, the touch points go on and on, to an extent to word of mouth. But these are the things that we have to hear. We have to hear a high point that makes us kind of the light bulb moment of, oh, what happens next? Well, sign up. And in the end, I collect and I share something. And that is key to an origin story, actually having a clear beginning, middle, and an end. Because if my 
big goal at the beginning is to collect and share something, and this story doesn't end with me doing that, then it's just an idea of a product. It's not an actual experience. But the experience, going from thinking about it to using it to then actually feeling the value, it has to play out like a story. And here's how that email did that in a very, very, very simple way. It's a few, a few key words. So check out my stuff on Pinterest. All right, that tells me that there's going to be stuff that's being shared. Share the things I like. OK, again, sharing, great. You can see it, exclamation point. Very, very, very simple, but a cue that hundreds of millions of people around the world were enticed by. Visual sharing, oh, that, yeah, I want that. So how do origin stories play out more abstractly in products or services? Generally, you've got who is this person, what is their big goal, then there's a problem, a trigger, or a pain point, and that's at the, at the abstract level. What, what, what do they need? What's not right in their world? They discover your product. This could be word of mouth, paid advertising, Google search, App Store, other channels. There's always resistance. Know that there's always resistance. That's good because what's going to overcome the resistance is that they should care. Why should they care? And more simply, how are you going to solve their problem that they had at the beginning? This is what people need to see. They need to now see this on home page, landing page, app store, email. They need to not just be told this is not sales pitching. They need to see, ah, this is what I'm going to be doing. That leads then into taking an action. So similar to following action, it's in this case an act. And in the end, their goal has to be met. Now the thing about goals, it could be fancy things like acquisition, activation, conversion, awareness, whatever words you use at, at, at your company or business or project that you're working on, these are all things that stakeholders, team members understand. So we're getting out of the story realm and we're actually talking about real, tangible, measurable things. And it's essential that you measure outcomes. Goals and stories are measurable. Now, the thing is, and this is a clarification I always have to make for myself as I remind myself, which is, you know, we're not marketing products. Some of us are, but this, this was, it was a marketing email that I got, and, and undoubtedly the Pinterest marketing team put it together. But we're, we're designing products, and what stories help you do, they not only help you become best friends with people on your marketing team, which is great, or if you're on a marketing team, help you become best friends with your designers and developers, but they help you envision the customer journey as a, as a hero's journey. It puts the user or the customer or the person on the other end back into the story and gets us thinking about what their story should be and then what we need to do to make that happen. It also helps us figure out how to incite that customer to action. Because there is no product without the customer taking some kind of action. So it's not some kind of devious, oh, let's make them click on the very bad button. It's really about knowing what humans need to do, their behavior, and how to help them do what they need to do with our product. Now, in terms of thinking about the, the, the customer's journey as a hero's journey, we're right now talking about a very standard model narrative arc. There are a million other types of story models. Hero's journey is one of them. It looks more like a circle. We've got ones with little cartoon characters on them. We've got spirals, <laughs> pointy things, and more fancy diagrams. If you, if you Google story diagram, you'll find more diagrams of stories than you do user experience. It's a very, very similar thing. Everyone's got a model. And the thing about all these models is they're wonderful. If you are a storyteller already or a filmmaker, you've got a model that you prefer to use, wonderful, go for it. In terms of the work that I do, I do find that the linearity of the, 
arc helps in a lot of ways. Because what it helps us see is, is time. This y-axis of time is something that we can utilize and it is a power that we can wield and it is one of our design materials. So if the goal at the end, it's, our goal is never, rarely to sign up for something. If the goal is to collect and share something. Signing up, that thing that happens at the end, that becomes its own story. And as such, it's something that we then need to focus on as its own story. So I'm going to show you an example of how that plays out in a different product. And what I'm going to show you is a Twitter onboarding from a few years ago. Similar to Pinterest, this is an onboarding flow that converted hundreds of millions of people around the world. And it not only converted them, got them to sign up, but what it did was it helped produce more users who are more likely to engage with the service over time. What Twitter was tasked with when they came up with this flow was they had a lot of people signing up for the service and not as many as they wanted returning and actually engaging with it over time. And so the challenge was how do they figure out how to get people to sign up and be more likely to return? What they knew is that if in your first session you followed at least 15 users, you were more likely to return. So, all right, let's have an onboarding flow, try to get people in and get them to follow more people. Now, what they ended up doing looked a little bit like this. It's just got some simple copy, welcome to Twitter, start a conversation, explore your interests, be in the know. The call to action is very straightforward. It's just, just sign up. If you want to do all that, you have to sign up. Okay. So you start going through this flow. It's step by step. There's some rising action here. You're, you're introduced to the Twitter teacher. This is a tweet. Now you're, you're introduced to your timeline, and they want you to follow people. And all right, keep following more. Oh, you followed a couple. All right, follow some, some more. And this flow is actually a lot longer than their previous flow. And we have this, this idea often of trying to build for frictionless experiences and make things easy to use, but this was, this was a lot more frictionful. So much so that you get to this point where it could be a kind of a crisis moment, where you've, you've done this for a few minutes and you're probably wondering, okay, what, how much more do I have to do? And why am I doing this in the first place? What is in it for me? So if you've stuck around this long, what you then get is the last step in the process, which is to find people you know. Now, after you've been doing this for a few minutes and you're not sure why you're doing it and you've been told, hey, you can be in the know, check out Twitter, seeing your friends are there is suddenly a huge value proposition. Because you've gone through this much effort to become a member of something and then, hey, your friends are here. You can add them, you can also skip it, because at this point, it's all good. You're, you're, you're in the know. Add your profile, sure, maybe fill it out, doesn't matter, you're in the know. You know what Beyonce is, ate for breakfast. You know what Bill de Blasio was up to yesterday. You're good, you're good. So the following action is merely functioning at this point to take you home. Because you might remember in the olden days, Sign up flows, check out flows, a lot of flows ended up with this thing that we call the thank you page, and it just kind of ended. That would be a cliffhanger. It doesn't answer that question of then what? But what we've got going on a lot now is you have to be taken home. But the thing about home, and it's another rule of thumb that a lot of us who work in web and mobile know, is that we never have empty states. Home has to be better than it was before, it has to be different than it was before. And it has to echo that journey that we just took to get there. So you're in the know, but structurally, you felt the value of what it was like to use Twitter. And I'm not just saying this, but they were able to produce many cohorts of people who were more engaged with the service over time because of this onboarding flow. It was so successful that they kept it around for three years, acquiring hundreds of millions of people. So how does this work if you reverse engineer it? Simple big goal, want to be in the know. All right, 
impediment. I just have to sign up. Okay, that kind of sucks. No one loves to sign up for things. But you start engaging with this onboarding flow. You start feeling boredom, lack of value, wondering why you sign up for this in the first place. But then you get access and membership because you're in. So welcome, but your friends are here. It's like a surprise party that's being thrown for you. Cool. Finish the flow, and now you're home, and you're in the know. Now, why this matters in terms of structuring this experience like a story, I've worked on a lot of products and services where that, that high point, that, hey, your friends are here, was in, when it's inserted too early on in the process, then we get cliffhangers. We get people wanting to sign up and then seeing, oh, I have to give you my Gmail information, and then they just, they leave. There's nothing in it for them. No one wakes up and says, oh, I want to go give this company I don't trust my Gmail information. There has to be a reason to do it. In this case, the story is sound. It flows and it happens at the right point. Now, abstracting this one level, this, this flow, this journey, it's simply who is the hero, what is their goal, what is their problem, incentive, or call to action. This is when you can think of a, a, a you know, real hero's journey, an adventure tale. There's a call to action. Ideally, it's something that resonates with them. Otherwise, good luck getting them to click on that button. Then there's a flow, series of events, things happen. There's always an impediment to that flow. And it could be an impediment like sign up or payment, if you've ever worked on Payment flows, often there's drop off at this point when you ask for their credit card information. Sometimes the story is just, oh, it's safe and secure. Don't worry. I've worked on, on some products where, where the answer to that crisis was, hey, give us a call. For very expensive enterprise products, people like to call salespeople sometimes. It could be just mental hurdles. People could be bored. They could see lack of value. It could be usability issues. This thing might be really difficult to use. Then they have to experience the value of using this thing. And their problem that was introduced early on has to be solved. I've worked on a lot of products also where usability wasn't the greatest. But when this high point is high and totally awesome, People love the product. They don't remember how crappy this flow was or how they kept getting lost. And they tell their friends about it and keep returning over time. So there's a lot of power. And again, there is science behind this, which I'll explain in a moment. There's power to the high point. Then the flow has to finish. Again, the thank you page is not an ending. What then? It's a great question to ask yourself. Then what? What happens next? And in this case, the simply the, the goal has to has to be met. And if it's a sign-up flow, you probably then take the person home. But the goal has to be met, and you constantly want to ask yourself, then what? Because this this story, this structure, if you think like soap operas, it can it can keep going on and on over time. So this is on the very tactical level. This is step by step. A story happens with you click, and it's on a screen. And this, this can happen also, though, in, in real life. But journeys are, are tangible. They're actually people doing things and moving forward. Stories can also work on an even more abstract level, a lot, lot higher than this, in our heads. So I'm going to show you an example of what wasn't such a great story. This was a patent that Apple filed the year before the iPhone was launched. It's an iPod that makes phone calls. It was what everyone wanted. People were begging for, I love my iPod. Can it just make phone calls? So they filed for this patent. How did it make phone calls? Well, you dial like this. It was worse than a rotary phone. So why did this never see the, the, the light of day other than in the, 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 the patent archives? Well, here's the, the cliffhanger. All right, 
I listen to music, I make phone calls. Those are my simple, simple goals. This is what was going on in 2006. And it sucks to carry two devices. So if you were like me, you were like my friends, we were running around just saying, Apple, come on, give us an iPhone. We named it for them, just call it iPhone. That, that trademark actually was taken, they had to buy it. Just give us our, what we want. All right, so you have an iPhone. It's a smartphone, what we just saw in that image, that is a smartphone. It's a two-in-one device. Now that, in the actual prototype that you, you saw on the previous screen, that it's, a, it's a big, eh, it's a, it's a cliffhanger. If that was released, it would not have been very exciting. It would have not been the success that the actual iPhone ended up being. Now, what was the story of the actual iPhone? You know it looking like this, which is something completely different, almost a completely different device with very different functionality, but some similar core functionality than what the patent was for. This was a touchscreen device. It's not what anyone asked for. So how did this function as a story? What you've got is a bigger goal that someone like Steve Jobs recognized and that a company like Apple was tuned to. Communication. Much bigger of a goal than I want to make phone calls, I want to listen to my music. Which are noble things, by the way, very noble. But communication, I want to communicate with the world around me. Communication also means two ways. I want to consume things and I want to communicate outward. So what's the problem with that? Smartphones suck. It's kind of weird, it's not what people were saying at the time. I had a Trio, I loved my Trio, it was the coolest thing ever. It had three different colors styluses, It's awesome. But no, the story is, hey, smartphones suck, you need to know this. The iPhone, it is a smartphone, however, there's always a crisis. Now what was going on at the time when the actual iPhone was keynoted, announced to the world, it's that there was just resistance. A lot of people were saying, you'd see this in the press, you'd hear this at the water cooler, oh, I don't want this thing, or you know, there were a lot of usability concerns, people saw that it had a, a, a touch screen, and the, the, the thought was, wow, touch screen? Like, touch screens suck. You're taking away my keyboard? This is gonna be terrible. What is Apple thinking? They're, you know, another dud, another Newton. Oh my God, this is, this is gonna be awful. You probably already had an iPod, so who wants to go out and buy a new device? You probably already had a mobile phone. There are all these reasons why not to be sold on this idea of the iPhone. So again, we're in the idea plane still. So what did they do to overcome the hurdle what Steve Jobs ended up announcing and introducing to the world is the best way to communicate. Now, it's not anything people were asking for. They just wanted, you know, a phone that, that, uh, that played music. It was a three-in-one device. Now, when he presented the idea of the iPhone to the world, he kept iterating about, you know, he would, he would joke about, it's a, uh, an internet communicator an iPod, a phone, and he kept saying that over and over again. People were just kind of, in the audience, a little, little dumbfounded, although they're Apple people, they knew there was something gonna be good happening, and he kept, he kept explaining that over and over and over again. And what this device could do was pretty much anything, except install apps, but luckily hackers took care of that. Then Apple started doing it. But what it could do, simple things, but in a revolutionary way. You could get animated maps. You could see where you were in the world at any point, as long as you're okay paying $3,000 in data for that month, which that was fixed too, don't worry. But it just did all this stuff. You could order a thousand lattes at the tap of a couple of finger taps. It was like magic, and it was crazy easy to use. These were, were the words that, that, that he used over and over again introducing this concept. It works like magic. It's the best way to communicate. This thing is, is great. So at the end, the mental math going on is, oh, you want this, and you, you have a better way to communicate. Now, why did this story work so well? Well, 
it could have been a story that was more like this, which is, all right, you want to communicate, smartphones suck, um, here's a two-in-one device, communication. It's just, that's, that's what we call anticlimactic. The iPhone had was a solid story built around a universal goal that people could identify with. So much so that their advertising campaign, when it launched, had one word in it. Hello. This is how confident they were building something around a story that had a simple goal like communication and the confidence to say this is the best way to communicate. Now, again, this is a commercial. The keynote presentation is kind of like a very long commercial. We're not selling products. We're designing products. But what stories at the conceptual level help you do, they help you can communicate a shared vision of what something is and why it might matter to people. And they help you innovate and prioritize against that shared vision. So everything you put into that product or service has to amplify, has to fit that story and continue it for your customers. And it helps you align towards that shared vision. Internally, externally, everyone needs to know what the story is. The simpler the story, the more powerful. But the story isn't just, again, communicated or sold. It then flows through everything from unboxing Apple's very, very, very strong stories and how you unbox. There's a, a climax to that when, when you open the box and at the high point you see this gorgeous device and it's not covered in, in um, a funny foam or, or translucent stuff. It's there. You see it. You're excited. The story is clear. The story is then continued as you start setting up your device and onwards, and it goes into the interface. So stories are something that you want to build into every touch point, every aspect of everything you do build and communicate as a business, a brand, a team. Now, at the startup, the fitness startup, where story ended up saving us, we, we worked similar to how I, I should have been working very early on in film school, which is we mapped the hell out of everything. We figured out what the storylines were, then we figured out what we needed to support the story, where our gaps were, what could be, what wasn't working. We tested everything, we made sure constantly we were on the right track. We didn't make the stories up, we heard it from our super fan customers, and then we made sure that it's something that other people wanted. And in the end, we had stories echoed throughout product where the high point was that people experienced value or delight, ideally both. It was something that worked so well that we doubled engagement by thinking story first, and that we also, t I don't know, there's no word for this, but uh, 10 times to the amount of paying customers. So people were not only now signing up to use the product, trying it out, returning to use it, but they were putting their money where their experience was, and they were, they were paying for it. Now this company is doing, doing great. Story is what resonated with people. It's what engaged our customers. Just like a TV show. This is Vince Gilligan. He's in front of a story map for season four. And what TV writers know is that if you want to engage an audience, keep them engaged over time, you need to think about the story first, and you need to know what matters when. You need to know how to make things go boom. This is a close-up of a card around three quarters of the way through season four. If you've seen it, you know what I'm talking about. If you have not seen it, you now have homework, and you should watch the series from the beginning. But stories make things go boom. Now, is everything a story? The answer is, is yes and, and no. Everything is a story. We're wired for story as humans. And no. So task flows, habit loops, stories flow through that. This is fantastical if you play around with any app that you think works really well, I want you to start looking for stories everywhere. Fantastical 
something as simple as adding a calendar event, it functions like a story. You can keep doing it over and over and over again. Compare that to a cliffhanger and something like the Apple Calendar app works very differently. Stories can also be huge. They can be something that structures long-term engagement. It could be hours, days, months, years, stories. I've helped companies figure out why engagement is dropping off after five years, and we realize, ah, that was a crisis. Here's what we need to actually continue the story. Now, the key here is engagement. If engaging customers, engaging people is something you need to do, story is an amazing tool and way to do that. If you're working on something like a banking site, however, this is Chase Bank. Let's say you're building a new website or you're building the bill pay system for Chase. Does that need to be a story? Well, it depends. Compare something like Chase or a regular bank to something like Simple. Now, with Simple, you've got a different interface. You've got saving with ease, spending with freedom, different promise. And what they even spell out is current balance doesn't tell the whole story. With a product like Simple, software is the service. If software is the service, you need to have a strong story, not just told, but flowing through everything to get people hooked and interested in using your product over the time. Because it's not just software that's the service, it's software is, is a story, essentially. Compare that with something like Chase Bank. I live in New York City. There's a Chase Bank on every corner. The competitive advantage to Chase Bank is not currently their software. It's that they're convenient, they're everywhere, they're multinational, and the list goes on and on. At the point that a bank like Chase is going to need to actually have a leg up on software, story is going to be essential. So why story? Now, this is where I'm going to bring up a little, little bit of the science stuff. But I want you to think about this for a moment. There is no such thing as an actual experience. There are only series of moments in time. So we've got seconds. And a second, when I said that ago, it's gone already. And now I'm in a new second, but that's already gone. There is no actual anything. All we have are memories. We have memories, and the way that we structure those memories is with one thing we call the peak end rule, which is we remember the highs of an experience. We remember the thing that came closest to the end. And we process story in this way instantaneously as we compute in time and then after time afterwards. When story enters our brains, it, it, it activates a lot of stuff. A lot of stuff happens. So we're more likely to see, and there are a lot of studies on all of this, we're more likely to see utility in things. We're likely to give a pass on usability. Things feel more usable. We then also find things more desirable because we remember how awesome it was. We see the value in things because value ideally came closest to the end. And it's likely to influence choice. A lot of studies show that people are more likely to want to repeat an experience if it's structured like a story. So the key here is not just story, but story structure. Now, next time you're working on anything, what I want you to think is, because I know we get caught up a lot on tools and process, and, and you know we work in tech design. We're, we're wonderful, yes. But I want you to think not what color should this be or what, what tool should we use to build this. I, I want you to think, what's the story? And I want you to also start thinking, how, how can this story perhaps be never ending? Now, I've got a lot of resources on my website, blog. It's greatnorthelectric.com. I also am publishing a book in the next couple of months with Rosenfeld Media, so you get lots more information. Want to see what you guys are working on. I'm happy to answer questions. I'll be hanging out here on and off during the day, and, and I would love to chat in the hallways. What I want to see is the stuff you guys are working on, and also for you to stay in touch. I can also help you with your project or with your team. Thank you. <laughs>